Okay. Hebrew, chapter 2, and we're going to pick it up with verse 10. Is that clear? Clear as it's going to get, I guess. So far in this chapter, we've learned that God gave earthly dominion to man, not angels, but we learn that man has not gotten up to that dominion yet. But that man uh, has not gotten to it of himself, but that he has reached it in his representative, shall we say, Jesus Christ, uh, around verse 9, and that uh, Jesus, in order to do the work that God gave him to do, is going to have to become a man and he's going to have to suffer as a man in order to save man. Verse 10. Well, let's go back and pick it up with verse 9. But we see him, Jesus, who was made a little lower, a little while lower than angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for every one, and hold on just a second, let me crank up my ears, okay, uh, for it was fitting, or entirely appropriate, for him for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to perfect, or to make complete, the author or captain or source of their salvation through sufferings. I think we read all of this last week, so we won't read it all again. Uh, the emphasis, by the way, beginning with verse 10 and running all the way through verse 18 is no longer on the comparison between Jesus and the angels. We've finally uh, left that, but on the unity, we're going to look at the unity between Jesus and his people and why that had to be. Remember, this was a great Jewish objection to Jesus as the Messiah because he suffered and died and was humiliated. Uh, and the question is, why did Christ assume a nature that is a little lower than the angels so that he could taste death for every man? And the answer is, it was fitting. It was fitting. Uh, such a way of saving man shows God's love for us, that he cares for all of his creation, and uh, considering the nature of God, the nature of man, and our dire situation that we got ourselves into, uh, this perfectly suited God's plan. And he says, notice the description that is given here to God. For whom are all things and through whom are all things means that everything has its reason in God. Everything. From the beginning to the end. Everything. These two emphasize the idea of fitness. It was becoming even to a God for whom are all things and through whom are all things, a being like that, it was still fitting for such a being to save man through his son having to become a man and suffer and die. And I like uh, the Christian standard verse. It was entirely appropriate. It fit God's, shall we say, nature or personality, personality perfectly to do it that way. Uh, <coughs> Now, when it says here to make Jesus perfect, to make him perfect, <clears throat> I don't like that translation. Uh, I, the idea is that Jesus had to become a man. He had to experience all that mankind faces and experiences himself, including and especially the temptations, 
the pain, the humiliation, the grief, and the disappointments, all in Isaiah 53, that we face at some point in our lives. Uh, Yes. That it completed when he went through all this circumstances. Yes, it makes him qualified. He had to be a man complete to experience everything that man experiences before he would be qualified to save us. And especially another step that we're going to be getting into, it was necessary for him to do that if he was going to be a merciful and faithful high priest. He had to experience all of those things in order to save people who are just like him, at least from a human standpoint. Uh, so uh, he was going to then become the author. I don't like that translation either. The Greek word means to lead and to go first. And it has a many different ways the uh, captain, source, pioneer, founder, leader, prince, all of those things, he had to blaze the way to go first and get the job done so that we, his children or his brethren, could follow him. Any questions? Okay. And here's the assumption. For both he Jesus, who sanctifies, makes men holy, NIV, and those who are sanctified, that's the many sons of the previous verse, are all from one, and the word Father has been added, and I think appropriately, uh, one Father, one family, or one source, I found the translation which add, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them Brethren, and it is unusual to me that he describes Jesus as the great sanctifier because it's usually, that role is usually mentioned as being whose role? The Holy Spirit is mostly mentioned as the one who is sanctified. It's not a conflict. I'm sure they're both involved in it, but it's a, an unusual way of describing Jesus, the sanctifier, and his brothers, those who are sanctified. Uh, so, Jesus is the one who makes us holy. That's another way of saying that because holy and sanctified are almost identical. Yes? But I mean, it's his, it's his blood that cleanses us, so yes. he does sanctify us. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. What he's uh, speaking about there is that through our faith and obedience to the gospel, Billy issues the invitation every Wednesday night. When we obey that gospel and believe the testimony of Jesus, we come into a new status, a new relationship with God. Before we were enemies, now we are reconciled. Before we were unholy, but now we are sanctified or made holy. Now that is a one-time event that occurs at our conversion, okay, when we become Christians. <clears throat> but after that happens, there's another responsibility that there's a responsibility that falls on our shoulders, and we'll call it we have been put on the road of sanctification because we are to strive for it in our everyday lives ourselves. Now, what Jesus did for us was to make us, as far as God is concerned, 100% holy and acceptable. But we want to show that in our living as much as possible. Some people call that progressive sanctification. We want to be more holy in our lives as we strive to do every day. Uh, and how important is it? St. Luke, chapter 12, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Now 
That's why that is so important. Unless we are reconciled, made holy, sanctified, then we are still an outcast as far as God is concerned. Uh, it says in verse 11 that he is not ashamed, as you might suppose, by one who is so powerful, so exalted, so holy, but he still, and this is remarkable, not ashamed to call somebody like me his brother. That's amazing. And you his sister. Brethren, by the way, includes all of God's people, male and female, but of course in the Bible it's always brothers. He is not ashamed to call them brethren. I think I've got a quote from Augustine here. Yeah, God makes of sons of men sons of God because God has made the son of God the son of man. Now Augustine is a what, fourth century Christian theologian great theologian from North Africa, but I read that and I was struck by how wonderful a saying that really was. Uh, okay, speaking of calling them brethren in uh, this and the next two verses, the writer wants to show the Jews who are in danger of defecting back to Judaism that this was nothing new which has been his theme, will be his theme throughout, that it was predicted in the Old Testament that Jesus had to go through this process in order to save men. And uh, he clearly demonstrates that even under the law of Moses, God had revealed his purpose that the Messiah had, was going to become, had to become one with his brothers. And he could not... Uh, be our brother unless he was a full human being as we are. So, the idea of being all from one father, the point of the quotations which follow is that the Messiah, or Jesus, even though he was above angels, is represented as associating himself with you and I, even though we are lower than the angels, as brothers, since we depend upon one heavenly Father, we both depend, or all of us depend, upon one heavenly Father. We are all from one Father, and since we are linked by that relationship with the Father, He is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. It's still an amazing thing to say. <laughs> but the Hebrew writer presents it so well. Uh, and we'll see this in verse 13 when we get there and it says, now I will put my trust in him. And we'll find it remarkable who made that statement. Uh, the last part of verse 12. Uh, let's see, no, verse 12. Uh, I still got that up there. Yeah. And this is how He's going to explain that he is not ashamed to call them brethren and say this is an idea that was in the Old Testament, saying I will proclaim your name to my brethren. Uh, yeah, that's you and I, the church. And I think the main point in this whole section is those two words, my brethren. And then secondly, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Now, this is from Psalms 22, again, written by David. Uh, in verse 1 of that psalm, verse 8 of that psalm, verse 16 of that psalm, and verse 22, which this one is, are all references to the Messiah. And if you'd like to turn over it sometime and read the Psalms 22, you'll see it's remarkable how many sayings are taken from that Psalm and applied to Jesus Christ. He says, I will proclaim your name. And the psalm was written by David, I think, to, uh, uh, as he recalls the last seven or eight years of uh, his life before he became king. Does anybody remember what he was going through? 
And he was running from his life for his life. From who? King. King Saul. And I mean literally running from cave to cave down there in the desert, trying to stay alive, him, him and his small band of men who had gathered with him. And uh, in the uh, psalm, he presents himself as surrounded by enemies, which fits perfectly with his personal experience. And that uh, his path to the throne was very difficult and violent because he had to do that to save his life. If you'll remember, he had two or three times, occasions, or opportunities when he could have killed Saul. But he says, I will not lay my hand of God's anointed, the one whom God has chosen to be king. This is the psalm that begins with my God. My God, why, my has you, why have you forsaken me? That's the first line in Psalms 22. Thank you, John. Uh, it mirrors Jesus. I mean, you would think that it was the New Testament reading Jesus talking about his crucifixion. Yes. The entire chapter. Yes. It's a remarkable psalm. Only a thousand years before the events actually happened. Uh, but in the psalm, David still, in spite of his troubles, many troubles, declared his trust in God through it all. Which is, I guess he's a re that's the reason he was a man after God's own heart. He was delivered from all of his enemies. And afterward, when this was all in the past, it seems that whenever there was a joyous occasion, when there was a, a, a celebration and a, a grouping together of God's people in Israel and Judah, uh, that uh, he declared the name of Yahweh, David did, in that assembly. And secondly, in the midst of that same congregation, I will sing your praise. And that fits David perfectly. But it ultimately applies to Jesus. Verse 12. I, Jesus, will proclaim your God the Father, or Yahweh's name, to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I, Jesus, will sing your Yahweh's praise. That means Jesus has voluntarily associated himself with this throng of people who are together declaring, I trust God, and I'm going to praise Him in the public assembly, and I don't care who knows it. And Jesus is said, is pictured in all three of these situations as being intimately associated with that group that says, I will put my trust in Him and I will sing praises to Him in the midst of the congregation. That's the point. Yes. Yes. Uh, speaking of name, John, that was a good set there. Name generally signifies all that a person wants. So he was going to declare proclaim his name, his goodness, his power, his greatness, his love, his compassion, and all of the other things that we know that God is absolutely remarkable for. He was going to say that or proclaim that in that public assembly. So it stood for the whole character, the whole pro uh, person. So in this psalm, the writer sees Jesus as saying that he will proclaim God's character, not simply that he will declare the name of God. He will tell about him in that assembly. Verse 13, difficult. And gives us another example of the relationship between Jesus and his earthly brethren. He says, and again, quote, I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I am the children whom God has given me. I hope some of you read Isaiah 7 and 8. Isaiah 7 has that great verse, 714. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and will bring forth the son and call his name Emmanuel, of course, which is applied to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. 
And uh, chapter 8 has some things to say that are references to Jesus too. So both Isaiah 7 and 8 are easily understood as speaking of Jesus the Messiah. Now, the time when that uh, was written, Isaiah 8, 17 and 18, was about 740 B.C. Ahaz was king of Judah. Rezin, R-E-Z-I-N, was the king of Syria, up north, right on the northern border of Israel, the ten tribes. And the king of the ten tribes was a king named Pekah, P-E-K-A-H. And this wasn't long before the uh, nation of Israel was history because they went down in 722, about 18 or 20 years after these uh, incidents occurred. But anyway, the king of Syria and the king of the Israel of the northern ten tribes conspired against Judah, two tribes in the south, with King Ahaz, and it caused a lot of consternation, fear in Judah, because these were two larger nations. And they were going to, in fact, I think the first part of chapter 7 says that Syria had already come in and encamped in the capital of the northern ten tribes of Samaria and were apparently about to invade Judah. And of course, like I said, they were uh, in uh, great fear. But Isaiah and his two sons are the methods that God chose to give to Ahaz, the king, and Judah a message of either A, comfort, or warning. And if you look up the names of those two boys, one of them says, hates to the prey, and the other one is, uh, a remnant shall return. It all depends on, I guess, for Ahaz's reaction, which one he takes. But anyway, Isaiah's name means what? Jehovah's salvation, right? Or something like that. <coughs> so, uh, Isaiah presents himself and his two sons as the children whom God has given me. And let me give you the verses. There. Isaiah 8, 17. And one shall say, I will wait for God, who has turned away his face from the house of Jacob, and I will trust in him. Verse 18. Behold, I and the children which God has given me, and they shall be for signs and wonders in the house of Israel, from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. And notice it's from the Septuagint again. LXX. So your Bible in the Hebrew will probably read a little bit different. <clears throat> but anyway, Isaiah presents himself and his two sons as walking messengers, signs and wonders in Israel to put their trust in God. No matter how bad, bad things seem to be, that if they will trust in God, that he will bring back a remnant, okay? But they were signs and wonders, Isaiah and his two sons, as they lived and walked about the people of Israel for, as far as I know, their entire life. Any questions on that? Because you would never, <laughs> I would never pick that out. I said, Behold, I and the children which God has given me. Well, what does that mean? Well, you don't know until you go back and look at the context and try to figure it out, what is being said. <clears throat> the children whom God has given me is the Messiah, and using this language, uh, speaks as if he were a man. I and the children which God has given me. He sees himself as one with the people who depend on God, and by using this language, he speaks as one who is a man and who expresses his feelings 
how he and his fellow men as being devoted to God and showed that he was one of them and that he regarded them as his brothers. Uh, note that all three of the quotations in uh, uh, verse 12 and 13 place the speaker who is by the Hebrew writer said to be Jesus himself in the same group as God's children. He's with them. He's not standing afar, refusing to associate as if he were better. He's right in there with us. Uh, and let's see, Isaiah, I forgot about chapter 9. See if you recognize this. Isaiah 9, verse 1. But there shall be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee, of the Gentiles, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine upon them. That was the occasion in Matthew chapter 4, I believe it's around verse 14 or 15, where he leaves Nazareth and moves to Capernaum, which is up there in Galilee, right on the Sea of Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles, and Isaiah 9, 1 through 2, is the verse quoted as speaking of Jesus the Messiah. So you I forgot about 9, you got 7, 8, and nine of Isaiah, all having passages quoted in the New Testament as referring to Jesus. All right. Verse 14, 15 and 16. Therefore, what do we learn? Since the children share in flesh and blood, we do, he, Jesus himself, likewise all for also partook of the same flesh and blood via the incarnation that through and I think I added his yes, his death he might render powerless or ineffective him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives for assuredly he does not give help to angels but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. By the way, that therefore picks up where we got lost in the first part of verse 11. Let me read them together. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, everything in there is a quotation which is kind of a parenthesis stuck in there. But anyway, the thought picks up from back in uh, verse 11. They share in human, in, excuse me, in flesh and blood. That is, we all have one common human nature. And Jesus willingly shared that with us. That through death, that is, in order to do this, he had to die. In order to die, he had to become a man. And by doing that, he renders powerless the one who has the power of death, the one who can inflict it. And of course, his, the devil's dominion over the human race was in the form of death. And it says... Uh, in verse 15, so to free those who through fear of death. I remember, and Betty does too, when we were around Byron Boyd about a year or two before he passed away, he told us he didn't fear dying at all. What Byron said he feared was the process or what he might have to go through before he got there. And I have never let that leave my mind. I don't fear dying either, but sometimes, boy, as you all know, it can be an agonizing process to watch 
or even sometimes just to hear about it. But anyway, the fear of death comes because we are aware of our sin and our standing before God. That's, that's where the fear comes from. <clears throat> and it can only be relieved by the intervention of someone who holds the office of a high priest between us and God. That's the only way this can be alleviated. To stand between God and the sinner and to reconcile or make us friends again by his death and by doing that he gets rid of the fear of death. But it has to be done through a priestly mediation between you and I and God. And not just his death, but his death. And, but it says death, he's talking about his death and resurrection. Yeah, oh, which, yes. By which he could power over it because all men had died. Yes. <clears throat> Jesus was different in that he died and rose again. And ascended into heaven. Yes, when we say death, and I guess that's a good point, John, we're speaking of the whole process which began when he was died on the cross, spent three days in the tomb, spent 40 days teaching, went back to heaven, and assumed his role as on the right hand of God, offered himself up there, by the way, offered his blood up there, I believe, mm -hmm. and then assumed his office as high priest, and the great high priest, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God to mediate for us until the end of time. Uh, and it's 8 o'clock. Okay. Let's see. Where did we... Okay. Let's not end on the fear of death. <laughs> Let's see. What's verse 16 say? Oh, okay. That doesn't help us either. Okay. We'll end on the fear of death. And remember, the point is, you're not supposed to have a fear of death if you're a Christian. Well, at the end then, with 15, he died. It's, uh, I don't know, maybe mine didn't have it there. Maybe mine hasn't turned around. But, uh, no, that, in 14, we end, end with the devil having no more power. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the devil having no more power yeah. over the, of death. Okay. 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 Any comments? No. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the message that you've given us. And for Jesus' great love and his willingness to assume, to, be, uh, to presume to be our brothers and sister. We pray that you will bless us as we try to walk in his path every day. And Father, as we leave, we ask you to please be with us. Uh, Bill Thomas, as he struggles with the flu in the hospital, and with Corey's father, Steve Merrill, as he is having a very difficult time right now. And we pray, Father, that the, uh, the virus that's going around and causing so much disruption, that it will fade away or that we can find a cure quickly to limit its effect upon each of us and our nation and the world indeed as a whole. We know that you are the one who can take care of this for us, Father. And in this, we put our trust in you. Be with us as we leave. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.